now I'm going to switch gears a bit and talk a little bit about the brain imaging research um, that we've been doing. So I'll just have a disclosure to make. I'm not a brain imaging expert. I collaborate with a brain imaging expert um, who's, who knows everything there is to know about brain imaging. So, I mean, I feel comfortable talking about it and, and I, I know about it, but it's not my area of expertise. My area of expertise is more on the executive functioning. But this is research that um, I've done in collaboration with Christian Bulio, who's a, a brain imaging expert at the University of Alberta and runs the MRI Institute there. Now, there's another type of imaging called diffusion tensor brain imaging. Um, I had never heard of it up until about eight years ago when I, when I met Christian Bulio and we started working on this. And it's a relatively new technique. Um, it's not used diagnostically. It, it's used in a lot of research, um, and again, when we started this, there were two or three studies looking at DTI in FBSD. So I'll just use DTI to kind of do refer to diffusion tensor imaging. But what it does is it permits a virtual dissection of the white matter, or basically the wiring of the brain, as well as a degree of the structural integrity or the degree of the myelination. myelination. So, um, you know, we've got neurons connecting neurons in the brain, and this type of imaging, it's non-invasive, it's, it's, it's non-harmful, non-invasive. It, it um, follows the water molecules through the brain, and then you can map out the actual tracks in the brain. So you can see neurons connected to neurons going from the frontal lobe to another area of the brain. It's really, really interesting. So it's actually looking at the connections in the brain. Um, something you know we weren't able to do 10, 20 years ago. So we did a study. Um, it was published in 2008, so this is, this is an older study, um, where we looked at this white matter integrity, this diffusion tensor imaging across a number of different um, tracks um, in the brains of kids with FASD. So we had 24 children aged 5 to 13 and 9 to 5 controlled children. Um, and so basically they were assessed in a just a, a fMRI or an MRI scanner, and the DTI portion is only six minutes, that's all it takes in the scanner and then they, they do open another 15 minutes just to get the other um, uh, brain imaging parameters like brain volume and brain size because we can also get that. And so we have a, a scanner at the U of A hospital that's completely devoted to research. Um, so um, we do this, this type of research all the time. It's, it's still very expensive to use so we need to have large research grants to be able to do this because still it's quite expensive to do this on, each, on, on participants. And they just sit in the scanner, they don't do anything, like there's no task, we just look at the wiring of the brain, which is pretty neat. Um, so we looked at this in 10 major white matter tracks and four um, brain matter structures. So this is the actual brain of the participants, um, and these are the kind of images that we get. They're not in color in our brain, we've colored them for, to make it easier to look <laughs> really cool though, our brains are this colorful. But um, I mean, a lot of these tracks are kind of like a lot of these tracks. Researchers don't even know exactly what their each cognitive skill that the tracks are responsible for. They're usually connecting certain areas of the brain to other areas. But like, I'll, I'll point out a few key ones. Like, for instance, um, the corpus callosum. So this is one side of the brain, and this is the other side. This is the corpus callosum. So that's the largest white matter tract in the brain. That's what connects our left hemisphere and our right hemisphere. That's really important for transferring information across our brain, for making decisions and coordinating it. And they've actually shown that um, prenatal alcohol exposure can directly affect the corpus of callosum. And there are some studies that have documented um, complete um, agenesis or almost missing of the corpus callosum in some individuals with really severe fetal alcohol syndrome or fetal alcohol um, spectrum disorder. So it is an area of the brain that's quite affected. Then we have other areas. So here, um, Everything that is in green, there weren't any significant ab abnormalities, but all the tracks that are in blue, red, or yellow, there are abnormalities in either of those two measures, either on the right side or left side or both sides. So we do see um, seven out of the 10 tracks that we measured had abnormalities in the connections and that they weren't moving as cohesively in the same direction and the actual, we saw significant differences in the integrity of those tracks. And that's how you process information from, you know, processing information from one area of the brain to another. Um, other areas here, let's see here, this is the superior longitudinal fasciculi, which is known to be primarily involved in language. Okay, we know that kids with FASD have such difficulty with language processing. This actually connects into those um, Wernicke's and Broca's areas of the brain that we know were involved in language. 
Um, I don't even, I can't even remember all the names of all these tracks. But anyway, but what you can see here is, uh, so the corticospinal tract, that's somewhere, where is that one in there? Um, that's a primarily a motor tract that we saw abnormalities. Um, so the main take home message here is, you're not gonna remember all these tracks or anything like that, but this is the wiring of the brain. This is how our brain is connecting information from one part to another. And in 70% of the tracks that we measured, we did see significant group differences. Um, when we look at um, the gray matter structures, so not just at the white matter, but look deeper at the gray matter structures, we can also measure these parameters in those, and we see abnormalities, again, here um, in the thalamus, which is you know, really important for emotion regulation and a lot of those behaviors. We see in the uh, global colitis, and um, we did not see different um, impairments in the caudate, which actually it, research is interesting because you can find one thing and another person will find something else and there is quite a bit of research to show abnormalities in body and FBSD and other studies. So depending on the sample size, who you had in your study, um, and how you were measuring things, you don't always find the same things and we didn't find abnormalities there but most people do. So again here we found that three out of the four gray matter structures did show abnormalities in these, in these um, brain imaging parameters. So what we also did is we also looked at, um, when you do this type of imaging, you get overall brain volume. And, and so we found that when we look at the overall gray matter in the brain, we saw reductions um, in, in um, gray matter, in white matter, and in the total brain volume. So not only do we have these abnormalities in the connect connections, we tend to have a, a less brain volume and less white and gray matter in FASD compared to controls. And actually when we do those analysis comparing the, the tracks and the integrity of the tracks, we're actually controlling for the overall size of the brain. So that actually is taken into account and they still show abnormalities in the tracks. Um, we did a battery of tests in this study as well because we wanted to see whether or not um, correlations between these DTI parameters would correlate functionally with some of the cognitive difficulties and that's kind of my area, right? So um, they, they show difficulty on measuring the executive functioning, working memory, language, and mathematics. Not really anything new there. We already know that these kids have difficulties in those areas. This is a different way of graphing it. Um, on all of these tests, the, the mean score is 10 um, and then uh, standard deviation of three on either side and as you can see the gray kind of represents where typical performance would be so as you can see some of them still are within the average range but then we've got many that are that are way down here each dot is a distant by the way that are in the low average to really low average range so when you look at things like working memory that was really significantly impacted where there's only a few kids that are in the average range there's always going to be a spread of kids they're not always going to score at one area and that's why FASD is so variable so um, people that were presenting earlier mentioned you know what may work for one child may not work for another what works one day may not work the next day the kid the kids are very very variable and we see a lot of variability in their performance and this kind of shows that some um, because usually I just present a bar graph with a mean and that just shows you the average this kind of shows you where all kids are falling um, here this is a measure of language and then this is a measure of math um, so it kind of gives you an idea about that but actually um, Sad to say, we actually didn't see a lot of correlations between the cognitive scores and the brain imaging. And it doesn't mean that they're not related. Of course, we're measuring cognition, which is controlled by the brain. Um, it's just really difficult in this type of research when you've got so many tracks in the brain to kind of figure out which ones may be related to one specific cognitive skill, right? Where they're probably involved in a lot of different areas. We wanted to look at this further because Right here, we've kind of got these whole brain scans and then we've got this whole um, battery of tests that we're doing and we're not seeing a lot of correlations, but what if we look specifically, so if we look at areas of the brain, we know there's certain areas of the brain that are involved in math. We know there's certain areas of the brain that are involved in language. So what if we look at the tracks in those areas, then maybe if we look more specifically, we kind of fine tune our approach, then maybe we'll, we'll see something. So we did another study and we looked at correlations um, and we know that there's specific areas in the right hemisphere in the parietal region that are involved in math. And we know this in typical populations that areas in, our, in and around the interparietal sulcus is an area of the brain that's known to be involved in math. And so we thought, let's look at the tracks coming in and out of that area. And sure enough, we did find that um, the, the, the integrity of the tracks coming in and out of that area of the brain that's known to be a math area of the brain were significantly correlated with their math difficulties. So that's really neat. That's a direct correlation between brain function 
and cognitive function, which again goes to show that you know we can have this direct evidence to link what we're measuring back to actual brain damage. So 